Well, good afternoon. We want to welcome you all to the Flint Community Webinar on Coronavirus. This is week 58 and I'm excited to be back with you today. I think the team did a tremendous job last week holding down the fort and keeping the work going. I'm your moderator, Yvonne Lewis, and so excited to be a part of this tremendous work and our sponsor, we're being you know, brought to you today. We have some new actually uh, supporting sponsors, the Flint Center for Health Equity Solutions and the Prevention Research Center of Michigan and the 58 other partners who have at some point in time during the last 52 weeks or 58 weeks, excuse me, joined us for this webinar. We appreciate all of you and our panelists for being a part of this. And so for those of you that are joining us for the first time, we want you to know that our panelists are in the background ready to answer any questions that you might have as we go through our topics today. Our focus for today will be vaccines. What do you do now? Or what do you need to know about that second dose? COVID treatment and COVID equity and COVID equity update. We're looking forward to for the first time in our webinar, you'll hear from the health officer uh, of, this, of Genesee County and so many others are gonna bring some good information to you today, Dr. Deborah for Holden, Dr. Susan Wolford, Sherelle Brown, and Mary Catherine, along with uh, Gary Jones. We want to start off today really emphasizing it's National Minority Health Month. And of course, we've in the midst of COVID, everybody's talking about being vaccine ready during the month of April. I want to just emphasize something to you about the National Minority, uh, National Minority Health Month. One of the critical agencies that supports this work on a year-long basis is the minority, the National Institutes of Health, Minority Health and Health Disparities uh, section is NIMHD. They're focused in as, a, as to be the lead scientific researcher to improve minority health and eliminate health disparities. They have three very important focus areas, clinical and health research, instant integrated biological and behavioral sciences, which we'll talk about in a little bit, and of course, community health and population sciences, which is so critical. So I wanna invite for our round table today, the round table discussion today is Dr. Deborah Furholden, Dr. Susan Wolford, and Dr. Pamela Hacker. It's really important that we understand that right here in our community, we have the opportunity to benefit from the work being sponsored by the National Institutes of Health, Minority Health and Health Disparities, which we call FCHES. And FCHES is run by Dr. Deborah Fur Holden, which is, stands for the Flint Center for Health Equity Solutions. And she reminds us all the time that we are at the forefront of the health equity revolution. Dr. Fur Holden, you've been all over the nation talking about this. And I say that because you've been on CNN, you've been on uh, NBC News, you've been on ABC, you've been all over the place <laughs> talking about the importance of health equity. So talk to us again, as we're about to move out of this month of April, focusing in on minority health awareness, what, what's so important about this for us to know here in our community? Well, so we all hear a lot around health disparities. And when you think about health disparities, mostly what we hear is this group has more of that. We heard early in the pandemic, African-Americans were hit so hard because we had more pre-existing health conditions. But if you really think about it, that wouldn't explain why we were more likely to become cases. Having a pre-existing health condition might explain why you might have a worse outcome, but it doesn't explain why we were more likely to become COVID cases. Having diabetes didn't increase your vulnerability for contracting COVID. It might have influenced your outcome from COVID, but not your vulnerability. So, so the work that we do at the Flint Center for Health Equity Solutions um, and the work that the National Institute of Minority Health and Health Disparities and the Office of Minority Health and our great partner, Mildred Hunter, who's the regional health equity officer for region five, which includes Ohio and uh, Wisconsin and Michigan and, and, and the, the other states in, in this region is really about elevating that cause so that people understand why we do have these differences that we see in health. Oftentimes the factors that drive that are bigger than the individual factors. It's more than just what people eat or drink or how much they move their arms and legs. And not that that's not important. How, what you eat, what goes into your mouth, you know, how much you move your arms and legs, whether or not you have a, a primary healthcare provider, 
all of those things are important factors, but we also understand that there are systematic and structural factors that are as important and in many cases more important for determining people's health, health behaviors and health outcomes. So if you live in a community where you don't have a, a grocery store that has the kinds of health promoting foods that we encourage people to eat, or even worse, if you have a grocery store, but the price Mm -hmm. of the, the food in that store is outside of your family's budget, those are factors that we need to address. Those systematic and structural barriers are really what the health equity revolution is all about. How do we continue to do good dissemination, good health liter literacy campaigns so that people actually have good information to make better choices? But how do we also transform systems that by their very design didn't have all people in mind equally. We know we've got great disparities in access in rural communities for people with language barriers, for people with disabilities, for people who don't have health insurance, for people who have pre-existing health conditions. And obviously we've got tremendous racial um, uh, disparities, but we know that it's actually linked to inequities. The systematic, structural, social and political determinants of health so our work is around dealing with the all of it. And admittedly, this is a very new and weak muscle for our nation. It is a very weak muscle for us to think about and tackle problems this way, but that's what we're here to do. Yeah, and so Dr. Deborah, you mentioned so many of those, those items that, we, that fall under the umbrella of social determinants for health, you know, like where we live, where we eat, where we play, where we worship. And so it, it, it's one of the other things, and we're looking at all of that and talking about these factors, is that it's important for us to be able to document that. And I know, you know, historically, we talked about African American History Month a couple months ago, but historically, it was moving away from identifying race and ethnicity because it was thought to be a, a discriminatory practice. But you talk so much about the importance of identifying race and ethnicity as a factor in actually improving health outcomes. Yeah, well, how we've treated race in the past is as something that we try to control away. So people would do things like say, well, A is associated with B after controlling for race. And what we now know is that you don't want to treat race as some variable that we can put off to the side. What you actually want to do is you want to look at the data that we do have. And we have massive what are called health data disparities. There's a lack of good data to help us both quantify the problems and then also develop solutions that match the problem and then evaluate the impact of our work. So we gotta deal with health data disparities first and make sure that we do a good job of collecting the data, that we collect the data with the same quality for all people. Because what we've also found is the medical record for ethnic minorities, racial and ethnic minorities, seems to be not as good as the health record for their white counterparts. So people, like there's all of these biases that are operating in our system and our work is about overcoming them. So the first thing that we try to do is, what do the data tell us? So don't just take race out or put it off to the side like it's no big deal. Instead, disaggregate the data by race and see, is there a difference in who gets referred for care? and who gets specialty type care, and who gets better follow-up services, and who's able to access some of the, not necessarily specific to health services, but other important support services like supported housing and housing assistance, food assistance, rental assistance, and other things. We need to understand, is there disparity in who's able to access these other vital resources that we know promote health? And that's what we're doing. So race is not a nuisance in our model. It is the thing that we study. Right. Thank you, Dr. Deborah. And we often try to make this distinction because you're a doctor of epidemiology. So you look at all that data and numbers. But we have two doctors, one, uh, Dr. Susan Wolford, who's a pediatrician, and also Dr. Pamela Hackard. I saw her come in and uh, welcome, Dr. Hackard. We're going to introduce you formally in a little bit, but we do want to have the opportunity to jump into this discussion about health disparities. How has it affected uh, what your work in, in, in the county? Well, I've been working. I've been working so much uh, directed on the, in the county 
since January on COVID, I would be hesitant to speak specifically to Tennessee County on other aspects, but from the work I have done for the last 15 years, it, um, the health disparities is overwhelmingly a huge cause of morbidity, like things that are, are um, preventing you from being a healthy individual. That's really what morbidity means, um, and as opposed to mortality, which means you're dying of it. But you know, people have a lot of limitations from you know arthritis, uh, weight, and you know, weight-induced arthritis, um, vitamin D associated uh, cancers, vitamin D associated um, neurological problems. Um, there's, it's all so intertwined, and not only that. One of the things that I recall seeing quite often at my prior jobs is the response from the health systems when someone has a concern is so racially biased. It still is um, exists very, very much. And when I was working most recently at Henry Ford, I actually spent a fair amount of time coaching just before I was leaving to come here. I was coaching you know, my patients like, this is what you need to do because they're not going to ask you the questions that they they should. You know, they'll take you at your superficial word of it, and you need to go into it. And, and so, I think um, one of the first things we need to do is is really start teaching advocacy for the person's own health. Thank you, uh, Dr. Hackett, and that's one of the reasons why the webinar is so important. We can provide information to help people know the questions to ask, so that they can get the information to make a quality decision. So Dr. Wolfer, from your angle, from the, the, the PEDS perspective, what do you say? So I think this is such an important topic. And um, I agree with what's been said before about the structural racism and injustice that exists that really have to be addressed in order to improve the health of our population, including children. Um, as a pediatrician, I am focused more on the individual, however, and still in that space, I'd like to say that I am very grateful to the National Institutes of Minority um, Health and Disparities because they fund uh, much of my research looking at how we can empower individuals to make those changes while those bigger changes are being made, while those bigger changes need to be made. We have kids right here and now who have difficulties with excess weight. They have difficulties with asthma that's poorly controlled. They have all of those sorts of problems. And how can we help them overcome and get be as healthy as they possibly can be um, while those bigger changes are being made? So that's a real, another really important element here when we talk about the social determinants because we want to talk about how things impact us as an individual as our families and communities. And so the environment plays a big piece in that. So I just wanna shift a little bit because we're, we're about to embark in a couple of days on a really, another really important issue for our community. And that's the seventh year anniversary of the Flint the water switch from the Detroit water source to the Flint River, which we now, it's commonly called the Flint water crisis. And we know that this is an opportunity for us again to look at those differences and health outcomes and the impact of that, but also that this isn't over yet. We're still dealing with a lot of the issues that are related to it. But the one thing I wanna point out to us today as a community, even though there were a lot of uh, uh, disappointing things, discouraging things and, and difficult health impacts of the Flint water switch, there's so much that has been born out of that that has made our community unique and special. And so I wanna applaud all of the Flint community residents who stood up to be warriors, who stood up to speak out and let their voice be heard so that even though it took over a year, the voices were heard and the water was switched back to the Detroit water source and still advocacy is going on. So I wanna just ask again, if there are any other comments from our panelists today with respect to either uh, the crisis is that we're facing, but what would you offer, recommend to our, our listeners today as ways that we can continue to advocate for what we need to be healthy in this community? So the one thing that I would say is people have a lot more voice than they maybe even know. Um, and I, I'm gonna push for us to mandate equity. And when I, when I say that, what I mean is we need good laws and policies 
for equity, equity and resource allocation and distribution, accountability and, and, and having organizations who receive resources to ensure that they can and are getting those resources to people equitably. And then we need enforcement of those laws. We actually have a law on the books requiring the collection of demographic data for COVID testing. It was a part of the CARES Act. All CARES Act COVID testing providers are required to collect basic demographic variables. It's never been enforced. So what was happening is our health department would have to do the work of calling people and going back and trying to backfill that data. Of course, in the face of the vaccine rollout, there have been an increased demands on their time. They're not able to devote all of that time to doing that. So we have this great law that would allow us to answer the question, are we still doing a good job of testing people fairly and equitably in the community? But we have no enforcement of it. So the burden has become the responsibility of the health department and volunteers and all of these other things. So I encourage people, reach out to your elected officials, right? You're elect we elected them for a reason. Legislators are supposed to make laws and executives are supposed to enforce those laws. And we've got two things happening. We've got laws on the books that have no enforcement behind them. And then we have a gap in that some things don't have laws. We have no law requiring equity and who's getting that COVID vaccine shot in their arm. In the absence of that, it has become the burden of communities and people like Dr. Hackard and the great staff at our local health department to try to backfill those gaps. So we'll talk about it later when we talk about our policy uh, recommendations, but you, 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 you gave your vote to your elected officials. You know, it's time for us to make sure that they're clear on what our want and our will is and that we really make sure that they're doing their job. Thank you, Dr. Deborah. Uh, Dr. Hacker, we brought it back to the to the to the coronavirus and the vaccines conversation in all of this. What um, additional comments might you have with respect to uh, addressing this issue? Well, I, I love uh, Dr. Perholden's comments, and I think you're spot on with that because, um, and this is not actually Genesee County that I'm even referring to. Um, this is other counties uh, though in the state and in the area that the laws are there, but they're not being enforced and they are, they are very um, distinctly not being enforced. When health departments will try and contact the uh, you know, law enforcement agency, they are told we are not going to investigate. And in fact, um, at a previous county that I was at, the county commission said that the health, they passed a resolution that the health department was not allowed to spend one hour of time enforcing it. And they, that was the resolution. And there's a lot of issues with that, but when you're in the middle of a pandemic and that's the situation you have, it's hard to find someone who's gonna take the argument, unless it's the community, take the argument up higher um, because the health department was all trying to do the contact tracing and testing Plus there's a lot of political fallback when, the, when it's been mandated that you don't work on trying to enforce the regulations that are put in place to protect the, um, the citizens. And so community partners play an enormous role in all of these things. And um, particularly when there's a crisis going on because that's where the voice can make the impact on the elected officials. Thank you, thank you. Dr. Wilford, did you have anything you wanted to add? I see you. Sure, no, I, I want to say I agree wholeheartedly with what's been said. And then in this month with a special emphasis, I would say that um, support the work of the National Institutes for Minority um, Health and Health Disparities. If there's a possibility to participate and to contribute either with your ideas or your participation in any research that's going on in Flint, try to do that. And then for oneself as an individual, advocate, keep asking questions. If you feel like you haven't gotten the care that you need, keep asking questions, do not give up. And this is a really important area for us to also emphasize with our community health workers and social workers, as you're getting this information, we wanna encourage you to apply for those uh, credits that are available to you, but you also encourage to take this information to those who may not be able to be on the webinar with us today. I was given information that we have the uh, 
assistant superintendent of schools on. Uh, does he have an update for us in this area? Uh, assistant superintendent Kavalyn Jones II. Hey, hey, how's everybody doing? How are you? <laughs> I'm good. I, I just, you know, I just wanted to come in here and be a part uh, of what was going on today. Uh, not necessarily a lot. Uh, just, just really want the community to know that Flint Community Schools is, is adamant about keeping our children safe. A, a safe child can be an educated child. Uh, and so that's our focus is, is keeping our scholars safe. They are currently back um, with the distance learning uh, schedule, meaning that all of our scholars are virtual. Um, and our, our also our staff is back uh, at home as well, teaching from home. Um, and so we're, we're, we're just, you know, we're real serious, uh, even though we get pushed back about our decisions, uh, we're, we're, we're serious about the safety of our people. And, um, you know, we look to the future and hope that uh, we can say that in Flint Community Schools, we've done our very, very best to keep everyone safe and ensure that our families, our staff have been safe uh, during this time. Uh, there's some antigen testing that's going to be offered to our, uh, our scholars and hopefully our, their, our parents at some point, uh, just to, for those that have not taken the vaccine, uh, just to ensure that we are doing our very best to cover all bases. And so uh, that's where we are. Uh, we're continuing to feed our families. We're up to 1.8 million uh, uh, 1.8 million meals served since this pandemic started. And we're just continuing to do all we can. Uh, one other thing I will tell you is that we are offering MSTEP, which is standardized testing to our scholars uh, by way of appointment. Uh, we are having small groups come in because the state did not waive, uh, the feds did not waive the standardized testing. Uh, so we had to offer it to all of our scholars. And so we are encouraging our scholars to uh, take that appointment so that you can uh, learn from, you know, learn where you are and parents can, can be informed of where you are currently in your learning. We understand we're in a pandemic. Uh, we understand that, you know, this is not the ideal testing environment, uh, but we're doing our very best to uh, comply and keep our scholars safe as well as our staff. Any questions for me? Thank you, Assistant Superintendent Jones. And I want people to also know you're working closely with the health department and the university to make sure that you have the data and the information you need to make those quality decisions. Absolutely. I, I, was, I was very happy to work with Dr. Uh, Furholden, who I hold in high regard. Uh, uh, just just the information, the data behind uh, decisions we make, we listen to our health community. And um, I'm not the expert. So we have, to, we have to go to the experts and do what is best. Even though we want our scholars in school, we, we don't want them in an environment where they can actually carry uh, this virus to our adults in our building or even you know, carry it around the community. So we want to do our very best, and I appreciate uh, Dr. Furholden and the team for just keeping Flint Community Schools in the know and helping us make informed decisions. Thank you so much. And for anyone that has questions, please put those questions in the queue. He'll be here to answer them for you. We also have Gary Jones here today, and Gary is representing the, the, the state out of the governor's office, and he has some updates for us today. Uh, he's a really, really busy man, so he's going to be able to give us these updates, and he's got to scurry away, but Gary, thank you for being here with us today, and, and give us those updates, please. Yeah, my, my apologies. I know I always have to kind of hop on and hop off, but, you know, as you stated, there is just a lot going on, so just a couple of things uh, that I wanted to uh, bring to everyone's attention today. So actually, yesterday, uh, Governor Whitmer visited the community vaccination clinic at Shiloh Missionary Baptist Church in Flint. 
Uh, she was there to observe the ongoing COVID-19 vaccination efforts and ensure that the safe, effective vaccines are being distributed efficiently and equitably. Uh, she was quoted saying that community sites like Shiloh and Flint will help us reach our goal of equitably vaccinating 70% of Michiganders who are 16 years or older more quickly. Uh, we must all continue to do our part by masking up, social distancing, washing our hands, and most importantly, getting vaccinated as soon as possible, end quote. Uh, as a result of Governor Whitmer's uh, request of the federal government to help get more Michiganders vaccinated as quickly as possible, more than 200 federal personnel will be arriving in Michigan this week to assist at three mass vaccination sites. Personnel will serve both clinical and non-clinical roles at the vaccination sites. Uh, also recently, the governor and the Michigan Department of Insurance and Financial Services have announced that the state has secured agreements from many of the state's health insurers to further extend their commitments to waive all out-of-pocket costs for COVID-19 testing, vaccinations, and treatments. These agreements cover more than 90% of the commercial health insurance market in the state of Michigan. And yesterday, Lieutenant Governor Garland Gilchrist, along with the Michigan Coronavirus Task Force members on racial disparities, recognized the first anniversary of the Michigan Coronavirus Task Force on Racial Disparities. To date, the task force has made significant progress towards reducing COVID-19 mortality rate, rate disparities for Michiganders of color. And also the task force members recognize that their work must continue to address racial disparities in vaccine adoption in communities of color. The Lieutenant Governor will be launching the Making Real Change Tour across Michigan soon to ensure that work continues and allows for direct community interactions. And I could not thank uh, Dr. Pearl Holden's uh, contributions to that Disparities Task Force enough. Um, of her contributions have been invaluable, uh, not only just here um, in Genesee County and Flint, but statewide too as well. And finally, I always end by uh, giving the uh, website, the michigan.gov backslash COVID vaccine catch all for anything pertaining to the vaccine in Michigan and michigan.gov backslash coronavirus for all COVID-19 related news statewide. Thank you, Gary, for rounding out this round table for us today. I wanna to certainly appreciate Assistant Superintendent of Schools at Flint Community Schools, uh, Kevin Jones II and Dr. Deborah for Holden. Dr. Pamela Hackard and Dr. Susan Wolford for sharing those very important tips with us and insights for us today. So I'd like to take this opportunity now to formally introduce to our webinar, Dr. Pamela Hackard, who is the medical officer and the director of the Genesee County Health Department. And Dr. Hackard has just come in and hit the ground running helping to set up this, this plan that we have for our community. And so Dr. Hacker, we certainly appreciate you and welcome you to the Flint Community Webinar on Coronavirus. Thank you very much. You know, there's always questions for you. And one of the questions, you know, we talked about the vaccinations for many weeks. And now, as was mentioned by Gary and others, many people have gotten their second doses. I don't know how many thousands, Sherelle will tell us, or hundreds have gotten their second doses so far. But one of the questions is, so now what? Second dose, what's next? Hmm. Um, what's next is uh, we still need to protect things, but the longer we know um, these vaccines are working and they continue to uh, lengthen the amount of time that they feel this is very protective, um, the better it will go on. I don't know how many people are familiar with the original rollout of the HPV vaccine, the one that protects against cervical cancer. Um, that was initially rolled out as something that would be a very limited time. They gave it an average of four years. And my daughter at that time was 13. And I thought, well, I would rather have her have that four years of protection when she goes off to college. And so um, I delayed it. And then as we knew more and more about it, that length of four years turned into seven. And now it's really thought to be something that will protect you basically your whole sexual life. Um, but when you delayed it, we found out that when you delayed the vaccine to like age 16, which is what I was trying to do, um, it actually isn't as effective as if I had given it to her at 11 years old. When you are 11 years old and you get that vaccine, you only need two shots. And then by doing the um, delaying it, it actually means children need to get three shots of it. 
and it's still it's a it's a wonderfully effective shot, but it's not quite as effective as if she had gotten it earlier. So um, that's where this is going, um, and you will you'll you know see these things stretching out and saying, oh, we're finding out that this vaccine works, you know, for a year. This might be you know longer, um, which is what I'm hoping, and the longer we have to examine what's been going on, the longer they will potentially um, extend that. So, um, and then the question of all these variants and how are these variants affecting it? The variants will come, um, the variants will start to settle down one, the more vaccines we get out there because these vaccines that we have now do work against the variants. They may not be quite as effective, but they do work um, and you would not, have the same risk of transmission were you to catch a mild um, or moderate even um, illness because it's dependent on the level of vaccine. So um, that's one of the things I, I would urge people is that when you are fully vaccinated, please keep with, um, you know, I've now gotten to the point where I'll say, are you vaccinated to someone? And then they'll go, oh, hooray. And then we take off our masks. We still maintain our you know, six to eight foot social distancing. We still try and meet outside, um, but, but it's, it, it just, it's a, it's a really, it's almost like, wow, I remember these days when you could do that and talk to people and see what you know, their faces look like underneath this. Um, so, so those are what's coming. Uh, they are still looking to see if there is a thought that we would need a booster shot. And they have not at all decided yet because the shots we have now are effective against all the variants we're seeing. So that was a question I got even last night. Are we going to have to get three doses now? But I think we've talked about this, um, Dr. Hackett, on a number of occasions here on the webinar, that we're in, we're, we're all a part of a really big research project. And I know that Sometimes people have an aversion to that term of research, but this is a learning for us. And Dr. Reynolds often reminds us as we're learning something new every day. So again, encouraging people to, to continue to mask up if they get that dose, it's still important for them to do that. Um, and so if the question too became, what if they don't get that second dose at the, the, the time? I had a person call and said, I got sick and had a really bad cold bronchitis, so I couldn't go to get my second dose. What do I do now? So I think most people also have heard that there was a time when England was doing that delay. Um, they had variants arise during that time. It had nothing really to do with the fact that they were stretching that delay out. It was just, you know, kind of bad timing. With one of the two uh, dose vaccines that we're giving now, the Moderna or the Pfizer, if you just got the first dose, it's considered about 80% effective. And when you think, well, is there really that much difference to me between 80 and 95%? Yes, there, there is. It turns it from a one in five chance if you're exposed. Um, so a small gathering of six people sitting at a table together you would be one of the people exposed and have a chance that you will have now infected one of your friends or family um, to one in 20. And I don't know if my life is, is a little smaller, I don't think of it as smaller, but I rarely am with a gathering of 20 people unless it's a holiday um, in my home kind of thing. And so there is like the difference between the 95% effective and the 80% is like, Something we do all the time is have family you know, dinners with five or six people. We rarely have them with 20 um, or go out to a restaurant with that many people. But also um, it's protecting the number of people who will get the full blown um, COVID without a vaccine by having your risk go down. And that's where we need to protect against the variants. It's because it's so many people are getting COVID that even if the risk of getting a variant is, is you know, one in three or 400 million, that's how many, you know, we've had a billion people infected. So, so again, when we look at the two, the two vaccines, the Pfizer and the Moderna, it's 21 to 28 days. So how, is, is there a window when a person should, all right, you did Sorry, ask that. I missed it. 
Yeah, so, so you do want, the ideal is to do it the way they did it in the testing. Three weeks for Pfizer, four weeks for Moderna. But um, up to six weeks is still well within the recommended guidelines. The CD or the um, ACIP, that's the uh, immunization now. It's a immunization now is part of the CDC. The ACIP is an independent um, group of people who are evaluating the, the uh, studies, but they put their findings out through the CDC. So it's independent, but not. But immunize.org is a part of that. And the recommendation is if for some reason you did not get your vaccine within six weeks, the health department or whoever gave you that initial vaccine kind of gets a little black mark against it because you're not within the known helpful time to get the second vaccine. That being said, we are also told put that vaccine in their arm whenever they show up. So we would never even like look askance at someone who comes in like two or three months later. But, but what we know is that it's gonna you know, be very effective to boost it if you come in within that six weeks. So again, encouraging people, don't delay if you don't have to, but if there's a reason for delay, still show up and get yes. in contact to get that second appointment. Thank you, well, Dr. Thank you. Is there anything else? Cause you have a wonderful staff person, Sherelle, that's gonna come and give us some real uh, additional insights from the health department. Is there anything else you'd like to add for us to, to us today? Um, just these are, these are remarkably safe vaccines. They really are. The Johnson & Johnson vaccine that they have paused, um, when you look into the numbers, it's really lower than what other vaccines sometimes have, but it's just, it's under such scrutiny now um, because of the you know previous 10 years of political climate of the anti-vaccine movement. It has, you know, receives a lot of um, additional scrutiny, but the newer ones, the messenger RNA, that technology has been used for at least 10 years now for other forms of um, delivery of medications. But I think that that is the way that vaccines are gonna go. I think we're going to be going away with the, um, the, tech, the older technique of doing it because these vaccines are so effective and they're so safe that I think we will be looking for, when everything settles down, we'll be looking for ways to translate some of the vaccines we currently have into mRNA vaccines. Thank you, Dr. Hackett. And you know, you're always welcome to come back and share with us at any time. And we appreciate you allowing and, and supporting Sherelle uh, Brown to come and give us these updates every week. She's been doing a phenomenal job. So Sherelle. She's the best. She's, she's here. Come on, Sherelle. Tell us what we need to know for this week. Good afternoon. I will be giving you more updates in Genesee County. As of now, uh, Overall in Genesee County, almost 215,000 individuals have received uh, COVID-19 vaccine, which makes us at almost 40% of individuals within the entire population to have received their vaccine. So we're making great strides there. And Genesee County Health Department alone, we have administered over 66,000 doses of the COVID-19 vaccine. And we want you all to know that 25% of individuals 16 and older have been fully vaccinated within our county. Next slide, please. So we want you to continue getting tested and continue coming out to receive your vaccine. We are seeing increased variant cases within Genesee County. So it's important that we continue testing, we continue social distancing, we continue to wear our masks and continue to get vaccines in our arms. Next slide, please. So we have our standing testing sites in Genesee County and these testing sites include the Word of Life Church, Bethel United Methodist, as well as the Macedonia Baptist Church. You can also receive testing at the Genesee Community Health Center, 
Walgreens, your local Rite Aid, or any of the Hamilton Community Health Network locations. Um, I do want to emphasize that testing has increased over the last seven to 10 days. It looks like there have been 300 more tests per day compared to the last seven to 10 days. So testing has increased, which means that we're getting the message out to our residents to stay safe, get tested, and also to get their vaccines. We have our locations that are still up in effect every day, Monday through Saturday. You can get a vaccine through the health department at our uh, locations listed on the screen. We have Bishop and Flint Northwestern High School, which are both drive-through clinics, as well as Our Lady of Guadalupe Church. Uh, today we did do walk-in clinics over there and that is becoming more and more at our faith-based uh, COVID-19 clinics. We are allowing walk-in. So we still encourage you to go online to schedule your appointments, but for if any reason you can't schedule an appointment, um, you can walk in to any of those locations. To schedule an appointment, you want to visit gchd.us or gcforme.com. And if you're having trouble online, the phone number that we've shared uh, time and time again is still available to you and we can help you get an appointment. That number is 810-344-4800. Thank you so much, Sherelle. And I'm sure you're going to be getting lots of calls because one of the things people are asking is, you know, everybody's eligible now to get those vaccines. How do they get in line? And so calling or making that appointment online is, is really critical. So thank you so much for sharing that. Yes. And I do want to say when you go online, there's no pre-registration process. When you go online, you're actually scheduling your appointment. So you get to choose what site and even which vaccine is suitable for you. And we want parents to remember that if you have a child that is 16 or 17, that they must uh, schedule for a clinic that provides the Pfizer vaccine. So what's important about understanding is that we can help have people understand now they can actually literally make their own appointment by going to the website. Yes, ma'am. Awesome. Thank you so much, Sherelle. Appreciate your sharing with us today, which really makes it a, a good segue for Dr. Susan Wolford, because when we talk about getting tested and we talk about getting the vaccination, one of the important things for us to understand, Dr. Susan, is what treatments are available and, and, and how do we understand to get the best help for ourselves? Are there some things we can even ask our doctors about? Thank you so much, Yvonne. Yes, absolutely. There is something you can ask your doctors about. And that's what I would like um, for us to speak about today as we talk about monoclonal antibodies. So many of you may have heard this term and wondered what they were. But as you think about monoclonal antibodies, I want you to think about Star Wars. And I'll tell you a little bit more about why that's what comes to mind. I'm gonna remind us a little bit about antibodies and how they work, right? So we know we have the coronavirus and it has these spike proteins. And we know that the spike proteins um, are what our body um, develops antibodies against. And the reason why it's important is because that spike protein is able to act a little bit like a key and to open up the cells um, in our lungs and our respiratory systems, get in and do a lot of damage. Um, we also know that when we have changes in their RNA and their genetic, genetic makeup, those mutations that cause the variants, it changed the spike protein a little bit and made that spike protein even better at opening up that lock, made it a better fit so that it can, those um, variants are very easily or very well able to um, unlock the cells and cause the coronavirus to get in and cause problems. So as we recall, antibodies, these little uh, blue items here, um, are created by our body specifically for the virus. So this, these antibodies attach to that spike protein and block it so that it can't open up the cells. Well, with 
monoclonal antibodies, instead of our bodies making the antibodies, which takes a few days for that to happen, meanwhile, we're getting sicker and sicker. Instead of that, what happens here is we get these clones. So the body, this is where the Star Wars deal comes in, because what we do in the laboratory is to take the antibody that it will fight coronavirus spike proteins that will attach to that and make clones of it. Just make lots and lots of it. And that then can be used to block the um, spike protein, just like if we'd made it in our body, but instead now it's made in the lab laboratory and given to us. And that then blocks those spike proteins so that they can't get to unlock our cells and get into our lungs and respiratory system. The question of course is, and it's important to note that when there are vi variants around like the British variant, um, and it changes that spike protein, do those monoclonal antibodies work as well at blocking that spike protein? And the answer to that is that it varies. And we're learning like everything else, there'll be more data, more information as we move forward. So how do we get it? Well, um, it's given oh, by an IV and it takes about 30 minutes to get that in. And after you get it, you have to wait for about an hour um, to make sure you haven't had a reaction to it. And it's so generally a one-time um, treatment. And um, who can get it? So this is really important. Generally, it's people who are not in hospital, but who have tested positive for COVID-19 and have mild to moderate symptoms and have had those symptoms for 10 days or less. So you have to be within that first 10 days of infection or of, um, of symptoms um, for the monoclonal antibodies to be offered to you. Um, and the third component that's very important is that it's for people who are at increased risk for severe outcomes from COVID-19. So you have to have a risk factor, such as being over 65 years of age, having chronic kidney disease, having diabetes, um, and being immunocompromised. So if you have some risk factor that makes it more likely that you will have a severe course with um, COVID-19, then you um, might be eligible for these monoclonal antibodies. There's one other thing to note that if you are on oxygen and you have an increased need of oxygen, then the, probably this one, this would not be offered to you. Um, but otherwise, this is something that you should ask about. If you are in that high risk category and you've been within the first 10 days of symptoms, you should definitely ask about the, if this is something that will help you. So well, Dr. Wilford, you say within the first 10 days of symptoms. So we're then in, it's important for people to make sure they're getting their temperatures checked and watching for those signs. Can you just remind us of what those signs are again? And absolutely. So if you have developed pretty much so many things, a cough, a fever, um, if you get difficulty in breathing, you're more than you're you're way down the road, right? So early on, you're going to get a cough, you're going to get a fever, you might get the body aches. Some people start with the GI symptoms, um, with the stomach upset and um, diarrhea, um, if the runny nose, uh, all of those things. If you feel like you are getting sick, if you feel a change in your body, you should get tested because you should be getting tested regularly anyway. But if you feel that you are feeling the onset of any symptom, you should definitely go ahead and get tested. And it's a nice window, 10 days to be able to recognize because other, other antivirals we have to give within 48 hours of the symptoms starting. So this is actually quite good that we have a 10 day window to be able to still offer this as an option. And it is available now at one point it was just available for certain people. And that gets us to the disparities question, which I'm sure Dr. Weber will emphasize, but now it's available to all of us. It is available if you meet these criteria. And now it is through the emergency use agreement, right? And so like one of them has been removed from that list because it's been found to be less effective, um, probably because of the variants. Um, but there are others, there are others still available. And you're right, this is a huge equity issue. Because if you look at globally who, can, who has it, it really is just the US and Europe, 
the rest of the world have very small amounts of this. So we are we definitely benefited by having it. And if we live here and have access to it, we should definitely get it. And so we should not let um, only certain communities in the US get it. Everybody should be able to get it if they meet these criteria. So ask about it. Thank you, Dr. Wolford, another good insight for us. So we have the knowledge now, we know what we can at least ask our, our doctors about if we're in that window. So this leads us now to this conversation for today, Dr. Deborah Paul Holden. Uh, this health equity issue is huge and continues to grow. So help us understand more of what's been learned through the Flint Center for Health Equity Solutions. Okay, great. So the first thing we always like to start with the data. Um, I just encourage people to make sure that you sign up for this health equity brief. Um, we, we are working in partnership with our colleagues at the Genesee County Health Department. I really appreciate um, that work because you know they have the data. They're also they have their sleeves rolled up and they're doing the work. And I like to give people the what so. So what so is we've done a great job and the, the health department and our other um, state uh, testing sites and our health department driven um, testing sites at increasing testing. That's what you want to do in a surge. You want to increase your capacity to identify cases. That's so important because then those people can take the needed precautions. And I've heard stories, somebody shared a story with me about somebody who they encountered in a store who said, yeah, I just got my COVID test. I'm waiting on my results to come back. You shouldn't be out. If you think you have, if you have symptoms, you should not be moving out and about. You should go get a test. And we have so many sites now. And I really thank Sherelle Brown for, for sharing that information with us where you can get tested and you get your results the same day. You can get your results in 30 minutes or less. If you have COVID symptoms, your thing is to get yourself and others out of harm's way. So the good news is um, our testing positivity rate has gone down a little bit. That's just one uh, metric. And that is predictable because we got more people who are being tested. And my thing is if you got a whiff of COVID, if you even have a slight inkling that you may have COVID, please go get tested. That is your best way to know what your status is and then keep you and others out of harm's way. We had about 2000 new confirmed cases confirmed in Genesee County in the past week. That's an 8% increase um, from the previous week. So even though that testing rate is going down, it's a function of we're doing better and more testing, but the actual number of cases continue to increase. And I'll show you that. Um, next slide. And so you can see, if you look at our uh, case rate in the um, county, it looks a little bit lower. Slight caveat for people on this is that oftentimes those case counts, you get counted as a case, not on the day that you your results come back, but on the day that you actually took the test. Why? Because that's the day that we know you were positive. And sometimes those results, there's a little bit of a lag between when you test positive and when those results come back in. So we can see in Flint, we've got an increase. In Genesee County, it looks like a slight decrease. We'll know the full picture in, in about the next week. The point is we're still high. Um, we've got a growing problem with missing data on race. Um, the red bar shows the number of cases with unknown race. That remains a problem for us. Um, and again, we talked about that a bit in the round table, we're gonna keep doing that. If you further break down this missing race data problem, what we find is there's some more things underneath of that. So what we did is we looked at in the communities and we're using a very technical thing called the census block group. But think of that as a cluster of blocks within a neighborhood. If you look at the percentage of cases with unknown race, what we find is we have greater proportions of unknown race for people who are coming for communities that tend to be whiter. The whiter the block, the, the whiter the community. And if you see, if you look at this, this, this sort of graphic and visual display of the data, we've got many more white boxes than we do darker colored boxes. So there's something weird that's going on here. And I think what we've got is a bit of a collapse uh, between some politics and some values um, and this public health crisis. And I'm just really encouraging people, let's uncollapse that. I believe in free will. I believe everybody should have the right to have their point of view and perspective and core values. But for us to really keep this a handle on this and to 
deploy resources and, and understand where our problems are, who's most impacted, we got to have the data. So independent of what race you are, or what political affiliation you have, or what your other beliefs are, we need the data. That data is helping to drive decisions and resource allocations. And we do see some um, disparities in who's either being asked or willing to report. There are some real key recommendations that we have here. I wanna hand it over to my colleague, uh, Mary Catherine Crawford, MPH, who's the generator of this health equity brief to sort of put it in context for us. Okay, great. Um, so let's just dive right into um, to, to, to what you were last talking about, Doc, and it's taking it's that our policymakers need to take action to acquire data. Um, we need to continue to talk about this and plead for this and ask that data is um, that the missing data is collected and released so that we can um, so that we can actually quantify racial disparities with assurance um, rather than guesswork. Um, and this then takes the guesswork out of, as you said, where resources go in our community to actually identify and prioritize the needs of community members and reduce health disparities while propping up equity building. Um, so the next major, the major recommendation I want to talk about is our voting rights. And I want to, I really want to echo um, that what that which uh, Mayor Neely said to our legislators, and that's to reject the 39 proposals put forth by the Republican-led legislature, um, all of which are aimed at suppressing voter rights here in Michigan. Um, in fact, I do just want to point out, um, even though we're very limited on time here, is that these laws are actually more restrictive than those uh, suppressive laws that were passed in Georgia. So not only do policymakers and nonpartisan groups need to reject this voting package, but we also need to work with nonpartisan groups uh, like voters, um, not politicians, to consider and propose rival ballot initiatives that would actually stop uh, the the uh, GOP's ability to to pass um, to pass uh, these restrictions into law. So what we're really counting on and asking for is reasonability from our policymakers, including the Republican representatives that sit on the panels and boards of these nonpartisan groups and speak of voting equity. So we're counting on their support, especially. Uh, the last thing I'm gonna talk about is our standing recommendation, which is mandate equity. We've talked before about the need to have multiple and diverse stakeholders at the table while we invest the American Rescue Plan funds. So I just wanna take it a step further today by talking about how we can actually adapt a racial equity framework to promote shared prosperity. And we can do this by stabilizing and strengthening minority owned businesses and actually, uh, you know, at the same time, systematically combat racism and economic inequity with our investment decisions. So these frameworks are really important because they can help our leaders tasked with fund um, distrib distributing the funds to identify ways in which we can allocate our capital toward opportunities that, that promote racial justice. Um, and so let's talk about what the community can do. So if you are out and you see businesses violating public health measures, Speak up. Health and safety must be our first priority um, while we reopen and continue dealing with this surge. So if you'd like to file a complaint, know that you will find forms on www.michigan.gov slash coronavirus. The link to the actual form is has tons of numbers and we don't have that kind of time to read the whole thing out. However, I wanna let you know there is an MDHHS COVID hotline that you can call. That number is 1-888-535-6136. And they actually can not only help you fill out and direct you to the form that you need, but also um, connect you with a translator. Um, the hotline's open Monday through Friday, eight to five. And um, yeah, it's really important. This will help keep our community safe. Um, the next thing I'm just going to say super quickly, download the My COVID Alert app. Know your risk of exposure. Help people get signed up and uh, drive them to their vaccine appointments. Share important links and numbers. And lastly, go to gchd.us slash COVID-19 volunteer to get involved in a community vaccine clinic right here in Genesee. 
Thank you so much, Mary Catherine Crawford. You did that really wonderfully. Got it all in there. Dr. Kerfman for holding. Thank you all for the equity brief. We want to encourage you, uh, community health workers, please uh, sign up for those continuing education room units. They are available for you. We also want to encourage our social workers that are, are participating. Follow the protocols that have been established. Make sure that you complete those forms, the post webinar survey and reach out to get your evaluations done so you can get your certificate for those continuing education credit, you know, credits. Uh, Gina is available to support you in that process. We would encourage you to like us on Facebook, subscribe to our YouTube channel, Healthy Flint, or email us with any questions that you might have at info at hfrcc.org. We appreciate you so much for joining us today. Call us at any time at 810-835-2130 if you have any questions. And remember, there is more to come and we will see you next week. Thank you for joining us.